This is the Stock Day Podcast, sponsored by Ion Digital, providing secure, compliant ecosystems you can trust. That's Ion Digital. Subscribe to us on iTunes and YouTube to stay up to date on penny stock news and interviews. Public information on OTC, pink sheets, and microcap stocks from around the world. Here's your host, Kevin Davis. On today's show, we're bringing you a brand new company. Name of the company is U.S. Critical Metals Corp. They trade on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol USCMF. They also trade up there on the TSX Venture Market under the ticker symbol USCM. With us today is the company's CEO, Mr. Darren Collins. Darren, welcome to the program. Oh, excellent. Kevin, thank you so much for having me. Darren, before we get started in the Q&A, Give my listeners an about statement. What do you guys do over there? I understand that you're a mineral exploration company, but tell me what makes your company different. Excellent. Thanks for that question, Kevin. So U.S. Critical Metals holds a portfolio of discovery-focused projects covering commodities characterized by significant forecasted demand growth, lack of supply specifically within the U.S., and applications critical to U.S. interests. Those include specifically electrification and national security and national defense. The projects that we're focused on are in great U.S. mining exploration states, specifically Nevada, Montana, and Idaho, where we're covering commodities including lithium, rare earths, and cobalt, again with the objective of discovering and developing new resources to meet U.S. forecasted demand for things like uh, electric vehicles and the like. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, what is the importance of, you know, discovering and developing assets in the U.S.? So it's really a security of supply consideration. So when we look back over, you know, mining and commodities general, generally follow a cycle. When we look back to really the end of the last cycle, call it 2012 when it peaked and then there was a period of, you know, declining commodity values and essentially lack of investment for call it, you know, 10 or more years here. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, foreign interests have really taken over not only the resources and reserves associated with these various commodities, but also the processing and refinement of these various commodities and, and ultimately the distribution. And what that means is that the U.S. is in a position right now where it's very dependent on these, you know, foreign interests to secure what are absolutely critical um, elements in in the context of you know production of various various products, whether those are electrical electric vehicles, in the case of lithium, whether that is you know things like um, national security and national defense um, technology, such as laser range finders and the like, and again in the case of rare earths, and you know again electric vehicles and smartphones and the like in the case of uh, of cobalt. So really, the U.S. is in a very unfavorable situation due to a lack of investment over this this timeline where you know countries such as china have really continued to invest and you know been quite uh, astute about you know predicting where the market's going to be and that's not only having you know resources and reserves within their own country but you know actually acquiring projects in foreign jurisdictions as well specifically in places like uh, like latin america so really what uh, what's important is you know from the emergence of, you know, countries such as the BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and, you know, BRICS, S, South Africa as well. Um, the U.S. is, you know, really under, uh, underinvested and, you know, that needs to be made up there to really, you know, shore up the, uh, shore up the situation for the U.S. and protect U.S. interests. Absolutely. Now let's talk about international development and commodities. Uh, you know, specifically I'm talking about lithium and, you know, rare earth minerals. Okay. So when we look at, you know, what has been going on internationally in, in the last cycle, you know, again, peaking in 2012, as I was mentioning, you know, it was really driven by the emergence of new middle class in various countries. Again, those, those brick countries where, you know, new products, new services, infrastructure, all these things requiring inputs in order to, 
you know, really develop and advance those interests, and, and that drove commodity markets. And then, you know, there was a period of lull, again, for about the last 10 years, and now I believe the theme that is really driving this this commodity market that we're looking at here where, you know, I believe we're in the, you know, initial phases of what could be a generational bull market in commodities given a bunch of factors, but, yeah. you know, again, inflation, things like that. But also, you know, the theme has changed in my perspective, where it was about globalization, now it's about deglobalization. And what I mean by deglobalization is countries, you know, looking at their domestic source of, you know, various commodities and becoming quite protectionist about them. And we can see this in emerging, you know, markets as well as developed markets. You know, for instance, in lithium, you have the, you know, Mexican government saying that, Lithium interests will be the interest of the national government. You have Chile, which is doing a you know partial nationalization. Um, so you have you know big interests in the world in the context of lithium that are you know taking this protectionary approach. Um, I think that that is going to be a theme that is really going to drive valuations again around security supply, and the U.S. really has a lot of catching up there to do. Um, lithium prices have been uh, have been volatile. Um, they reached a high. They've come off a bit. I think they're going to, you know, continue to uh, come back here very strong. And there's going to be some big opportunities here when uh, when they do, because you know certainly all the forecasts, the majority of the forecasts that you look at, estimate that there's going to be a significant supply demand gap. Um, that being that demand will outstrip supply, and when you have demand outstripping supply, you have obviously, you know, significant price appreciation. Um, that is also in the context of the U.S., you know, auto industry and the like, having access to those supplies domestically. So when those shortfalls do occur, they are able to secure lithium at um, at an advantageous price and not be dependent on those foreign interests. The best example of of that in the U.S. is uh, is GM's investment into a company called Lithium Americas. That was a $650 million commitment from GM. Um, they've released half of those funds out of escrow. But these are the kind of things that I'm talking about where you're going to have large strategic interests looking at, you know, domestic U.S. sources of, you know, lithium and rare earths and cobalt. And that's really going to drive a lot of valuation in this market. Wonderful. You know, I hold my hand on this. Just kind of tell me why your operations in the U.S. are an advantage. We just talked about the U.S. We just talked about international. Break it down for me. Uh, take your time. I really want to get into that. You know, tell me the pros and cons, uh, stability, price control, et cetera. You take the floor on that. So really the U.S. is is one of the best places, if not the best place in the, in the world in terms of, you know, ownership and property rights. Um, the U.S. has, you know, very well-established laws over hundreds of years, you know, administered through groups such as the Bureau of Land Management and, um, and similar government agencies, where there's a defined process and defined, um, defined ownership rights over, you know, both mineral rights and surface rights and, and things of this nature, which really differentiates from a lot of governments in, you know, lithium producing regions of the world where, you know, change in government, change in policy and overnight they're they're nationalizing assets and, you know, companies are, are obviously at uh, at the peril of uh, governments in in those situations. Um, so certainly jurisdictional risk from a US perspective is uh is much less than other parts of the world. Um, you look at groups like the Fraser Institute comes out with a great report annually that looks at um, you know the favorability for resource projects around the world and you know the great state of Nevada is is number one according to Fraser Institute and that's not only the you know ease of operating in terms of being able to permit the project and you know as I'm talking about security around government policy and the like but also in terms of, of resource project prospectivity because, hey, you can have all the great laws you want, but if the resources aren't there, then, you know, you're really not working towards uh, a favorable end. Um, so I would certainly say that. I'd also say in the context of environmental, ESG is, you know, very important. And, you know, the U.S. has a well-defined ESG, you know, protocol, uh, the NEPA process, the, you know, 
requirements to file plan of operations, do baseline studies, looking at the environmental impact of, of these projects where, you know, a lot of countries in the world, um, you look at cobalt, for instance, in, uh, in the Congo, uh, the Congo produces, you know, approximately 50% off the top of my head of the world's cobalt supply, again, used in electric vehicles, cellular phones, mm. um, you know, a wide spectrum of, of various technologies. Um, but the reality is that uh, the 17 mines currently producing in the Congo, the Chinese control 15 of them, Glencore Core controls the other two. But there's big concerns there. You think about things like uh, like child labor, environmental considerations, again. Um, there's a whole host of various factors that, um, you know, really positions the U.S. is is a very you know very modern and very favorable place to be to be doing business. Now, I also um, I also think about investing in in the U.S. in terms of you know stability of dollar things like this where you're not converting you know currencies into you know pesos or things like that where there's been a lot of volatility mm. in these markets. Um, you know, again, there's very well-defined labor laws. You know, people that are working on these various projects are getting treated treated fairly. So the U.S. really differentiates from from a lot of jurisdictions on that basis, and I don't see any reason why the U.S. shouldn't be, you know, at the forefront of, you know, really developing these resources in a responsible way that really delivers net benefits not only to, you know, American and international consumers, but um, also uh, also, again, in the ESG context. Yeah, Darren, I really appreciate that elaboration. Uh, You know, what's on the horizon for U.S. Critical Metals Corp.? What are you guys thinking in the future? So I'll go um, I'll go top down, and you know, looking at the sources of lithium in the world, you essentially have two sources and a third coming uh, coming to fruition. So the two predominant sources of lithium in the world are brine operations. Those operations predominantly in what is referred to as the lithium triangle, that is uh, Bolivia. Chile and Argentina, um, and then you have hard rock operations, predominantly from uh, from a rock called spodumene. Um, those operations are predominantly Australia, and uh, you know, frankly, from from both sources, brine in Latin America and hard rock in places like like Australia, the Chinese are really processing and then ultimately distributing to international markets that refined product product for things in you know things like lithium ion batteries and the like. Um, the third you know source of lithium that I talked about is actually lithium from clay, and that's what we're we're focused on in the U.S. Um, there isn't the hard rock opportunities that, you know, Australia or, you know, actually Canada has been doing a lot of work on developing hard rock resources and reserves. But there aren't, you know, the scaly greenstone belts within the U.S. that, you know, certainly Australia and, and Canada have. Um, in context of brine operations, there are some brine opportunities within the U.S. The only producing lithium operation within the U.S. is actually owned by a company called Abermarl. Um, it's an operation very close to our uh, our asset in Nevada that I'll talk a little bit more about. But um, that asset uh, produces about 5,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year. And to put that in context, um, Solar Atacama down in Chile produces about 80,000, 85,000 tons of lithium carbonate per year. So you get an idea of the scale differential of the Latin American and, and U.S. Uh, brine operations. But all that to say is that you know the U.S. really needs a secure, stable source of lithium within the U.S. And really where I think that's going to come from is, is lithium-bearing claystone. Now, lithium-bearing claystone has been developed out on a pilot plant scale and proven to produce robust recoveries, which ultimately means robust economics in the context of net present value, IRR, how these projects are ultimately evaluated. What is happening right now is lithium claystone in the U.S. is being taken from pilot plant scale um, to full commercial scale. And the tip of the spear on that is um, Lithium America's corporation in partnership with, uh, with General Motors. And as that plays out over the next couple of years here, what I think we're going to see is a significant re-rating in the valuation of clay assets within the United States. Again, it's commercially proven, and you have stable domestic resources within the United States with very strategic applications throughout the United States. So I think we start to see a premium on those assets as those various um, various catalysts play out. Now, taking that back to U.S. Critical Metals and our project in Nevada, so we're actually in the Clayton Valley area, which is where uh, where you have um, 
Albemarle, which is, again, the only producing lithium asset within the U.S. And we're actually up in the ridge. And the genesis of the lithium within this area, we believe, because, again, this stuff is volcanic in nature, actually originates within the volcanic mountain chains, chains and then is migrated down to the lower valley system. So we actually have our uh, our own basin within uh, within the mountain um just up from the valley over a ridge where, you know, we have very broadly disseminated lithium clay beds. We're sampling economic grade at surface, and we believe we have thickness up to about 250 meters or so of these clay beds. So the plan is there. We are fully permitted to drill the asset with the BLM. Um, we will be going out there to uh, to drill, to test those lithium clay beds, and coming out with those um those results here over, you know, we'll be drilling it over summer and then looking to have the, the results early early fall. That is a major catalyst for, for our company. And, you know, the idea would be is once we've kind of defined resources reserves, see how big everything looks, you know, move forward and actually start looking at the uh, the various development aspects of, of the project in terms of, you know, economics, extraction, um, all these these various considerations. That is the principal asset of the company. Uh, we also have several other projects. Uh, we are partnered on a project in Montana, Sheep Creek. It is one of the highest grade, you know, rare earth assets in the U.S. that we've identified. Um, very rich in neodymium and praseodymium, which are key input to various mm-hmm. military type technologies. Um, it's really quite crazy that China controls um, not only a lot of the you know resources and reserves and actual mining of rares, but also the majority of the processing of rares that are you know critical in the U.S. military complex. The U.S. has you know the greatest military infrastructure in the world, yet is dependent on China to you know have critical input to its technology. That includes the new fifth gen fighter, um, you know laser rangefinders, a whole host of technologies. So there's there's quite a disconnect hmm. there, but. Our idea is to, you know, get it to drill ready. We're going to have a permanent process there and then ultimately look to, to drill that asset as well. And then our cobalt asset is actually, um, I'll touch on that very briefly, in the Idaho Cobalt mm-hmm. Belt, which is one of the few places in the U.S. where you can actually find cobalt as the primary metal. And we're right next to, uh, to a fully commissioned mine, right on the geologic trend. So we'll look to uh, to get that to drill ready and then, and then make a drill decision there as well. So no lack of activity going on. We're certainly busy. <laughs> and, you know, again, the business, the business model of the uh, the company really to make the discovery of resources and reserves, you know, start looking at the economics of those, and then, you know, really looking at uh, optionality in terms of monetizing these assets to create value for shareholders. You've been listening to Darren Collins. He's the CEO of U.S. Critical Metals Corp. They do trade up there in Canada on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol USCM. Down here, you can find them on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol USCMF. Darren, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you today. I want to have you back in the next 30 to 45 days to unpack more updates. But until then, give my listeners a takeaway from today's interview. Well, thank you again for uh, for having us. And if there's one, uh, if there's one takeaway that I can uh, give is the timing is now. These resource markets, they, they move fast. I think we're looking at a generational opportunity here in, in commodities, again, given a host of factors that I've outlined, but also, you know, the macroeconomic environment in the context of inflation um, and things of this nature. So I've been uh, I've been working in resources for, for you know, over 15 years, and, you know, I'm certainly very excited about what the future holds here. So time will tell, but um, certainly a lot of a lot of good things happening in uh, in the sector and you know very excited for US critical metals and, and our prospects here so thank you again for listening Darren we look forward to having you on in the future uh, folks at home go ahead and check them out online they're at uscmfcorp.com that's uscmcorp.com it's been wonderful to have you looking forward to having you back soon excellent thank you for your time Thank you for listening. This program is entirely sponsored and produced by La Jolla Media LLC, which is responsible for the content. The opinions and information provided on this program are for educational and research purposes. Stock Day encourages all listeners of this program to do their due diligence and research when determining investment strategies that will work for them or to seek the assistance of an investment professional.